Okay, well, welcome. Um, we're going to be talking today about the curse of the testing pyramid. Um, but we're going to sprinkle in some uh, curses of Egyptian tombs that were discovered in there. So let's start by looking at some stuff uh, related to, um, and, and it is going to tie together. So just out of curiosity, uh, give a hand clap icon if you're mainly here to hear about the Egyptian tomb curses, and a thumbs up if you're mainly here to hear about testing. Let's see where everybody's at. Okay, we got some people for just the tomb, some, okay, testing. Okay, well, we'll, we'll cover, cover both th things here before us. So in the Valley of the Tombs in, in Egypt, there is a bunch of, uh, obviously a bunch of, Valley of the Pharaohs in Egypt, there's a bunch of tombs. And um, some of these were discovered in not, uh, not so long ago. And here's an article from New York Times. I think this is in 1922. So when they first found uh, the tomb of Tutankhamun. And um, the story that, that happened during that is they got into the, the tomb. I'll talk a little bit more about how it was discovered. But the, the main archaeologist that was driving things, um, <laughs> the main archaeologist that was driving things had brought along a pet canary that he kept at where he was staying to keep him company because it's evidently lonely out there. Uh, after they went in and broke into or opened the seal on the tomb and, and got in, they got back that evening and the canary was, uh, they, they heard this noise and a serpent had gotten in and it grabbed the canary in its mouth. And they got it away before he ate it, but it scared the canary to death and it, and it died. And this was considered a very, very bad omen because the uh, snake or the serpent that went ahead and got the canary was the same one that was on the, uh, supposed to be protecting the, the tomb. So these were the types of things that were going on uh, when the Tutankhamun tomb was discovered. So here's a picture of, um, this is Carter over here. He's the archeologist that had, the, uh, uh, had the, the canary. And then this is Lord, I'm gonna say his name right, Carnivon right here. We'll talk more about him here in a little, little bit. Whoops, my hand goes off. And then the, the woman next to him is his daughter. Uh, Carnivon had, um, he, he walks with a limp. He had been in a car accident, never fully recovered from it. Lived in England and um, at some point was told they needed to get out of England for his health occasionally. So he started going to Egypt and started collecting uh, Egyptian artifacts and financing uh, Carter's exploration of, of things. So this is at the top of the entrance of um, the tomb of Tutankhamun. I think this is before they actually got down, down in, into it. And I want to point out something here, that these three actually came back um, when, when no one was there and were the first ones to break into the, break into the I'm sorry, open up and go into the tomb. They, once they found the opening, they sealed it off and they were going to wait for the, um, like the ministers of archaeology or whatever in, in Egypt. But then they came back that night and, and got into it and look, looked around a little bit. And I want to point out that every single one of these people here are now deceased. They, they have all died. Um, and whether that's a coincidence or not, uh, we'll, we'll talk about here in a minute. So uh, this is Lord Caravan. Um, I'm saying his name wrong, I'm, I'm sure. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I think you're onto something here, Jake. Uh, this is his tomb where he, where he was buried. He actually died um, in Egypt, not, well, I think within a year after when they, they opened it up. He had a mosquito bite and he cut it with a, uh, a razor blade and somehow got blood poisoning and, and died there in Egypt. And they, they brought him back to his estate in, uh, in England. And this is, this is where he's buried. Now, one of the things that people discovered is actually they, after they actually got Tutankhamun's body out and started looking at it, they realized that he had a cut on his cheek and they wondered if it might actually be in the same place that Lord Carvon had his uh, cut on his cheek, but they didn't dig him up to find out, and they weren't sure exactly where the cut was, but that was something that was going around in, in the news uh, and things. Um, if this guy looks familiar in any ways, let me show you where he lived. This was his place. Um, if you've watched Downton Abbey, this is uh, the, the place that's featured on there. So it's High Clare Castle. Um, his descendants still live there, and in the basement of this is uh, a a Egyptian artifact museum and kind of telling the story of finding the, the tomb and stuff. And you can go visit that today. It's open. Uh, Downton Abbey has a lot to do with why people go and visit that and also why they've been able to do some repairs that were much needed um, that hadn't been done over the years. Now, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle attributed to Lord Car Carnav Carnarvon's, Carnarvon's, I'm sorry, death to elementals that were protecting the, the tomb. 
And um, there's other things that kind of happened around this time. At some point, there was, uh, this is Sir Bruce Ingram. He went to, I may have spelled his last name wrong, or there may be two spellings of it. But he went to uh, see some of the tomb stuff. And Carter, who he said was just very, very nice, gave him a mummified hand as a paperweight. So I have a, a designer friend that I asked to draw a picture of it because the, the hand had a curse written on it. And the curse was, Cursed be he who moves my body. To him shall come fire, water, and pestilence. So uh, Sir Bruce Ingram had this paperweight in his house and um, something bad happened. His house caught on fire. So check, we got that one. Uh, burned down a bunch of the house and so they repaired it and stuff. And soon after that, there was a flood. So they was destroyed by water. At this point, he thought they may be on, he may be, uh, maybe this wasn't all coincidence, so he got rid of the paperweight hand before he could be attacked by pestilence. Now, around this time period, so this is around 1922, um, Mussolini had been given some mummies from somewhere in Egypt, and he kept them in his uh, royal palace where he lived. After hearing about some of these things happening, he removed the mummies from his house because he thought it was just too dangerous to have them there. So here is a question for you. Based on what we've said so far, what do you think about the idea of there being a curse? And a Carter died of, uh, let's see, he died of um, cancer later on. There was another person involved that was smothered to death in their bed. Um, another person fell off seven stories and, and died. So all these people involved in this uh, uh, died. Um, even even the daughter, she's, she's dead now. No, she died in 1980, um, but, but she is dead today. Okay, and if you're um, if you're joining, there should be oh, let me bring it up. There should be a a thing above the chat that's poll everywhere that you can click things in, or you can go to that link. Um, I think somebody just posted it. Uh, if you want, because we're gonna have some of these as as we go. If you don't vote curse, you will be cursed. I've gotten some emails that look something like that. Okay, so we've got 18% of us think there definitely was a curse on the tomb. Uh, Five percent says there probably was a curse, but people believe. It, so they tended to die sooner um, and then see most of us are saying no curse people just paid attention to bad things to reinforce the idea of a curse and then nine percent of us are I'm not saying it's aliens but it definitely was aliens so we've got a, a wide range of opinions here so that's that's good and healthy right so people that have gone through and studied it says statistically people associated with opening the tomb didn't die early now they did all die but keep in mind it was in 1922 if anyone was a newborn baby there they would be 101 years old today so makes sense that a lot of them would have probably died out so what was driving the idea of the curse well it turns out look these three had sold the rights to the uh, to a newspaper to be there and write, it was the New York Times. So no other newspaper could report on this or be involved in it until, until later on. Now this caused a lot of ill will and stuff, but they also didn't want anybody sneaking up and actually getting into the tomb before they did. So they spread the idea that it was cursed, even though this particular, um, this particular tomb was one of the few that didn't actually have a curse on it. The, the hand was from a different artifact they had found somewhere. Um, so to protect the tomb, they spread the stories about a curse. Uh, let's see. And this is, let's see, this is the picture of them at the, at the top of it. So the point I want to make here is that, and you can read more about this, the curse of the mummy and stuff. And um, New York Times was telling the story and other people were picking it up. And it was a very uh, interesting thing and lots of attention at, at the time. So the thing I want to bring up is that stories can influence behavior. And sometimes we forget to ask if they're actually true. So we can do lots of things that are influencing our behavior without asking whether is this actually true. Um, and not only maybe it's been true in the past, maybe it's not today. Uh, but I think the, the idea of this curse was the story was spread and lots of people believed it because that was a story and it's interesting to believe and, and stuff like that. It makes a very, very nice story that all these people died that were down, down in the, uh, that had gone down into the tomb and desecrated it. So let's talk about testing. So here's an example of kind of how a lot of software projects or how a lot of work done. You've got some type of retire requirements, you figure out what you're going to do, and then you go through some development work, and then you do some manual testing, and then eventually gets, gets deployed. So this part right here, for a lot of us, has probably experienced the pain of waiting for, for manual testing. 
this takes a long time. There's lots of stuff to test and it can take a long time. So obviously we came up, people started saying, let's find some tools to automate this. So we started having maybe manual testing, but also automated testing. And everyone lived happily ever after, right? That's, that's it. There's the solution. Thank you for coming to my talk. I am finished. No, this isn't what actually happened for most of us. So let's see what your describes your experience with recording UI interactions and then playing them back to test software. Does everybody live happily ever after? So A, people do that. B, it works great. C, useful as long as there are few enough to make it easy to maintain. D, kind of useful, but they break and take a long time to fix or usually end up breaking and no one fixes them so they get turned off. What is your experience been? Okay, we've got some people saying that it does work great, so that's cool. But it looks like most of us are kind of in this camp of it, you know, it might be useful, but they break, take a long time to fix, or it takes so long that we end up just turning them off. Um, there's some people that are finding this balance of saying we've got a few and they're useful because, but we've got to have a few enough that we can maintain them. And 8% of us are like, what, people are doing that? When did that start? Okay, so this is kind of our experience here. We've got maybe one or a few people there saying it works great, but most of our experience has not been positive with this type uh, of approach. So everyone lived out happily ever after, except that they didn't. So before we were waiting on people to do the test, now we're waiting on people to update the test. And sometimes that actually is worse and takes longer than the, uh, than the test, depending on, on your situation. But the point is this didn't solve all, all the pain. Can be very, very useful. And I'm not trying to say that there's no situation where that would actually be useful. But our problems are they're slow to run. It's hard to tie a failed test back to the change. When you're, when you're just replacing your manual testing with automated testing, there's usually enough time between there that it's really hard to figure out what particular change caused a particular break, or was it just flakiness in the test? Um, and the UI tests are very, very brittle, right? It's easy. You can make some small change that doesn't actually break it for the user, but breaks it for your test because your test can't find it, or there's timing issues. All kinds of things can go, go wrong, wrong in this. So what might be fast to run, easy to tie to a failed test back to a change and not brittle, meaning you can refactor stuff. And so tests that are just working through the UI, if you go in and start changing the way the UI works, they're, they're all gonna break. Um, in software code, there are, there are refactoring tools when you're working directly with code and testing directly with code that you can say, I'm gonna rename this method, but also anything that calls this method, rename that call. So I can rename this method here or change it in some way, but then change all thousand places that actually try to make, make this call. And with, with UI tests, that's not the case unless, you're, unless you use a particular approach, which we'll talk about in a minute. Okay, so meanwhile, people started doing test-driven development and found it was a great way to do d development work. And test-driven development is fast to run. It's easy to tie back a failed test back to the change because you run them really often, right? You make a five line change and then run your test. And if it breaks and it worked before, you can be pretty confident that your five line change, something in there actually broke the way the tests work. And they're usually less brittle. Uh, they can be refactored. They usually have fewer dependencies. They're less likely to just be, be flaky because you're running stuff directly against the code instead of against the way that the user interacts with it. These don't test the user experience though, typically, because they're testing the individual pieces of, of the code. Okay, so we've got these tests up here. They're fast to run, easy to tie to a failed test, to failed test back to the change. They're not brittle. They can be refactored, etc. And then down here, we've got these UI tests that are slow to run, hard to tie a failed test back to the change, and the or UI tests, so they're very, very brittle. So the thinking was, you may have people say, hey, let's do more of this up here, this stuff we like, and less of this stuff down here that, that we don't like. That's the thinking that led to the idea of a testing pyramid, where we've got a user interface test at the very top, so just a few of those. We've got integration tests, they're kind of in the middle here, and maybe more of those, uh, but not as many as the unit tests we have. They're testing all the individual pieces of things, and we'll have lots and lots of those types of, of tests. So uh, user interface test, test things like this from the user standpoint. Uh, so we'll talk through these uh, three things we just saw on the pyramid. User interface tests are going to test things from the user's point of view. So how does the user experience the software? Um, 
Oftentimes they're created by the testing team after the fact to prove that they, they worked. Uh, it usually is meant to replicate manual testing. So take what would happen manually and make that automated. Uh, and they're brittle and hard to refactor. And they're often slow to run because you've got to bring up the application, step through the application. So those are the things that you have with user interface tests. So from, from that standpoint, yeah, doing fewer of these seems like a good idea. Well, the integration test test the way that things integrate. So it might be the way that your um, business logic interacts uh, down with your database layer or the way that these two modules work together. So the way that things all fit together. They often don't touch the UI at all um, because you're making calls directly against services or, or maybe even controllers. They don't always use the user's point of view because they're testing more of how the pieces fit together rather than how the user actually uses those pieces. Uh, they're usually easier to refactor um, and they usually run moderately quickly. You may need to hit the database with it, but it's not something where you're actually taking everything through a browser, typically. Then our unit tests are uh, small unit tests, often testing things at the method level. They never touch the user interface, um, and they don't always or don't usually integrate all the parts. So you're testing just a very small block of code. They also tend to run very, very quickly, um, because one of the big differences between integration tests and unit tests is, in general, the unit test isn't going to need to stand up a lot of infrastructure to, to test it. So for example, if you were working with Spring or some framework like that, your integration test might actually stand up Spring and test the way everything hooks together. The unit test would probably just hit the individual methods um, to see how, how they work and prove that they work and not even need the overhead of, of Spring. So, and these are just general, people put different things in different categories, but just generally talking about what makes up this testing pyramid. Okay, so, and, and this made a lot of sense um, in a lot of situations because, you know, tests that are really, really expensive and brittle and hard to change, let's do fewer of those, and then work our way down and then have lots and lots of unit tests down, down here. But then, we got some new tools, right? We also found some new patterns. And there was this thing called the cloud that gave us some new capabilities. So question for you, which question seems most useful in deciding whether you should create a test or not? Is it what shape it what shape is made if it were to if if I were to represent it with my test with Lego blocks or what return on investment I get from this test? And now this this may seem like a silly question. Okay, we've got one person that's like the Lego block shape is really where it's at. This may seem like a silly question, but it's easy for us to get caught up in a shape that was defined to solve problems that if we that we may not have anymore, or maybe different problems today, or may have grown in, in different different ways. So this brings us to our idea of the curse of the testing pyramid. So let's talk about some of the curses that we might run into if we're too focused on the shape of our tests, of how they distribute, and maybe not focused on the actual value they provide. So curse number one, trying to create a shape instead of value. So we should be asking ourselves, what return on investment do I get from each test instead of what shape is made if I were to represent my test with Lego blocks? So instead of asking yourself, oh, you know what, look, I'm going to write another test and I think I've got too many UI tests. I should write a, a, uh, write a unit test instead. Well, now I'm focused on the shape instead of what's the best way to get a return on investment for this next, next test I'm getting ready to to work on. And as way as of an analogy, so here's the distribution of IQs, right? Um, generally, they're centered around 100. And this gets recentered regularly because the IQs are actually shifting this way. Um, the way that the, the tests are done is about, about three points per decade. Um, lots of potential reasons for that. But imagine that this wasn't shifting and we saw this start to skew to the right. And most of the shift comes from uh, there being fewer people at the lower end of it. So, so the, the shape of this thing is moving a little bit to the right. Imagine if we were to say, oh no, we need to fix that. How can we change our education system to make sure we keep people down at the lower end there so we maintain the shape of this bell curve? Well, that's absolutely not what this is about. Just saying that our, the IQ is represented as a bell curve should not be something that we are trying to achieve. It's interesting to see how, how the, uh, how IQ is distributed and the shape is interesting to look at and say, okay, well, that makes sense. We've got people somewhat evenly distributed and maybe seeing how it, uh, 
how it grows over time and in different environments and stuff. But if we start trying to create the shape, we're probably going to do really, really bad things for society. So what shape provides the most value for your application, right? Is it a square? Is it a triangle? Is it a pear or a uh, strawberry? You know, it, the shapes don't really matter. If if a banana shape test provided you with greater value, then you should have banana shape test. Now that's silly. I don't know how you would make banana shape shape test, but the point is the shape the shape may indicate how our tests are distributed, but the shape should just be interesting to look at. It probably shouldn't be driving what we're doing, especially if it makes us stop thinking about what's the value this is actually providing for us. Okay, curse number two. Believing that was slow, what was slow in 2006 is necessarily slow today. So here's a quote from Martin Fowler. The pyramid is based on the assumption that broad stack tests are expensive, slow, and brittle compared to more focused tests such as unit tests. And, and this is really, really good because if we forget that this is why we had pyramid tests, we might go ahead and keep beer, building a testing pyramid even in cases where this is no longer true. And the reason that I think this is so important is because if we do have tests that we can make faster, um, we can make them less br brittle or less expensive, we might want a different shape. We might A testing pyramid might not be a good way to approach things if some of these statements are no longer true because we've got new tools or new techniques. So imagine a situation where, um, and this was a project I worked on, uh, or this is, the example is from a project I, I worked on where we had a thousand, I'm just kind of making up numbers to give you an idea, but if you had a thousand UI tests that take two minutes each, and you're just going to run through all of them, you're looking at 33 hours. Well, that obviously takes a long time. Um, that may not actually be worth it to you if it actually takes 33 hours before you get feedback. So that's way, way too slow in 2009, when, uh, which is the time period I'm, I'm thinking of here. But what if those tests were really, really valuable? Well, what if we had a different way of doing things um, where we could actually make them run a lot faster? What if we had four servers and 20 containers on each server? Well, then the 1,000 UI tests that take two minutes each would only take 25 minutes to run. So all of a sudden, we, we've changed what we used to avoid because it was slow. The slowness can no, no longer has to be an issue. In fact, the hardware that you run this on, if it stands itself up and tears itself down in the cloud somewhere, may be even cheaper than what you were running your other tests on where you actually had to have a box sitting under someone's desk or in a rack somewhere. So the point I'm trying to make here is that the cost and speed of running tests looks very different now than it did back in 2006 when maybe we were starting to think about the testing pyramid. And so we want to make sure that we're not using um, value propositions that were valid from 2006, but maybe aren't valid today. Curse number three, ignoring improved ways of doing development. So the pyramid was created as a response to UI tests being recorded by a team of testers. So you do development work and then you take something that was uh, that would record the screen and then it would use that and it would play, play it back. Um, there are tools to do this with Selenium now. Selenium, interestingly enough, was the cure for mercury poisoning. And there was, I think it grew into HP's testing tool, but there was a mercury or a testing tool called mercury that would let you record stuff and do things like that. So selenium was the antidote for, for mercury. That's where the name uh, selenium comes from for the, the tool now that the framework you can use to control your, your browser. But the pyramids was created as a response to UI tests being recorded by a team of testers. Behavior-driven development represents a fundamentally different way of doing development today. So behavior-driven development, some of the things it does is it leverages test-driven development. So we've got two loops. We'll look at them different in a little bit, but you've got your behavior-driven development loop and then your test-driven development loop. It also uses, makes your requ represents requirements as executable specifications. It does the tests from the user's perspective and the developers write the test backing code. And this is a very, very significant change because devs writing backing code is a huge benefit of behavior-driven development because a lot of the brittleness that you see when tests are being written after the fact are because the person who's actually dealing with the test and trying to update the test wasn't there when the changes were made to the application to understand how, the, how they work. So if you're in a situation where the developer is saying, hey, I need to change the application like this, 
25 minutes later, I've got the feedback. Oh, this test broke. Oh, that's right. I renamed this thing on the page. Let me change the name back or update my test to, to handle that name. Now I run my test. Okay, it works. And you move on. So you end up in a very different, a very different situation where you're getting the rapid feedback to not only develop your code, but develop your tests along with it and keep them in, in sync. There's also the page object pattern. Um, and I'm not going to go into really deep detail, but where, whereas the, the recording the screen takes the screen and thinks of it, okay, here's what happens on the, on the screen. And you may have thousands of these tests that expect the screen to look exactly like this. The page object pattern lets you abstract those things away and say, here is the API or a, an abstracted generic way of how I'm going to interact with this screen. So I have a login page and the login page is going to take a username and a password. And those fields are called username and password. Well, then if the app, and, and you may use that in 5,000 tests in different places, the page object pattern says, okay, but if someday that changes and maybe now I need an email address and a password or an email address and a two factor or something like that, I've now represented that all in just the way that that page, the way I've defined the interface to that page. So I can change it in one place and all my tests are automatically updated. So if you're, if you're dealing with pain, particularly in doing UI type testing, this can be used for, for other stuff as well, look up the page object pattern, make sure your developers look up the page object pattern because this is very, very powerful. Okay, so kind of a summary of the curses we talked about here are don't try to create, create a pyramid. Now, keep in mind, I'm not saying that your test will not be shaped like a pyramid, but using that as driving, trying to use that to drive how you, you create tests probably is not a good idea. You do want to enable the delivery of valuable software. Your tests might form a pyramid or they might form some other shape, and that might be interesting to look at, but that shouldn't be determining how you, what test you invest in is just the shape that it happens to produce. Now, it's, it's interesting because I was going through the, I think I gave this talk originally in 2001 or um, 2021. And um, one of the comments I had was, I've never seen anyone actually try to, try to do this, that they'd never seen anyone actually talk about deciding what tests to create based on the shape of the, the, the shape that it would make when you distribute your, your tests, which I thought was interesting because I've seen lots of teams actually do, do that. So you may not experience this, or it may be hidden behind the scenes where you, you don't realize that's what's happening. So what shape are the tests on your current project? Okay, option A is what tests? You may not even have any tests. B is a pyramid, an ice cream cone, an inverted pyramid. Um, a rectangle, you know, we've got tests all the way through. An hourglass would be where you've got a bunch of UI tests, not many integration tests, and then a bunch of unit tests. Or banana, just because it's fun to say. I should have used a pineapple. I didn't think of that. And there isn't a right answer here. This is just what are your, your tests doing. In different situations, you might be able to make a case for all of these being very valid, except for I don't know how you would actually do a banana, but maybe very valid for your particular situation. Let's see, let's see the comment here. So I see, see a question as we're feeling this out. That's a good question, Taylor. When we get to a good spot, we'll do behavior-driven development. I, I think that that type of thinking usually is rooted in a misunderstanding of what behavior-driven development does. Uh, because behavior-driven development is fundamentally a different way of doing development. If you see it as just a way of another way to add testing or just a way to do UI testing, you're not actually, you're not actually using behavior-driven development to drive a change in the way that you do development. And I've seen some people get some value from that, but it's not the same thing. It's just a different UI testing tool. And, and maybe that's good. Maybe that is valuable to you, and that's great if it is, but, but that's not changing your development process to try to get the full advantage of what behavior-driven development does. Um, behavior-driven development is very focused on creating the collaboration with the customer and getting that 
input right at the time that you're working on things and being able to iterate in small pieces all the way through. And the, the regression testing benefit of it is, is really great because you can make small changes and then get the full regression test being benefit of it. But that's just a piece of it. Um, and, and oftentimes a very small piece of it that enables the rest of BDD rather than being the key thing that behavior-driven development is about. Um, and that's a very good question. Great <laughs> Okay, so we've got lots of distribution. A lot of us are in a pyramid, and, and that may be perfect, right? This might be exactly what your application needs to be doing, because it does make sense in a lot of situations that you would have fewer things in the UI. Um, maybe you can test more with a single UI test than, than with others, and you can catch other things in the, in the uh, unit level, level testing. On the other hand, there are some times, though, where the majority of the application, the unit tests, actually test a lot less than the UI test test for you. I'll, we'll look at that just getting ahead of myself here. Okay. If a banana, if banana shaped tests provide greater value, then you should have banana shaped tests. The point should be the value you're getting from it. Behavior driven development with test driven development enables a new way of developing code. It may end up with more UI tests than a pyramid because if you're trying to drive all of your application, all of your development based on how would the user experience this, you may end up with a lot more tests kind of at the top of the pyramid. So because you're trying to ask yourself, how do I prove this does what the user wants? Now, you can end up trying to use BDD and just skip the TDD part of it, and, and that's not a good situation to be in. The test-driven development is still very, very valuable for thinking about how you design the the pieces of everything and proving that those work and, and being able to make iterations on, on that. But, but you may end up with more investment in the UI tests if you're thinking of this from the standpoint of how does the user interact with this. Now, teams I've seen that have really done well with behavior-driven development often write a bunch of stuff that's testing the UI and then they discover, you know what, we've tested this path all the way through and and now we need to test all the business rules of what you can do in this. So let's say there's there's 20 different combinations that you could select on this and go through the, this wizard. And oftentimes what they'll do is they'll say, okay, we probably don't want to, maybe we don't want to test all those different, you know, 20 times 20, and now you've got like 400 different things that could happen. Maybe we actually want to test the path all the way through so we know we've hit all the UI code. And then we're going to create a really big table that tests all the different combinations that, that could happen of hitting, but we're going to hit the controller directly. We're going to hit the, um, we're going to represent it as behavior driven development statements, but we're going to kind of say, okay, we proved the UI. Now we're going to hit just the business logic to show this works the way that you expect. So there's lots of things you can do like that. Um, and in some ways that kind of does push you from saying, okay, I've got, I've got a bunch of stuff in UI that maybe I'm saying I've gotten all the value from it. So now I'm going to put some, push some of these down to integration or unit level, still proving out things from the uh, customer's point, point of view. But the way you test your software is the most important thing in determining how that, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I forgot which slide this was. Okay, I'm gonna make a statement here. I'm curious if you agree with it, so give me a thumbs up if you agree or a thumbs down if you disagree. So the way you test your software is the most important thing in determining how long that software will be able to evolve. So give me a, a thumbs up in the reactions if you think that's true, thumbs down if you think it's not true, and it's fine, you can disagree with me. Okay, Ruth says no, okay. Got most people are up. A few people say stand down. Okay, so um, and it would be very interesting if we have time at the end. I'd like to hear the people that say that's that's not the case. Um, my experience is the reason that this has been my experience is because the longer something goes, if I can't prove it does what it's supposed to, I increasingly get to the point that any change I make has the potential to break something else. And so it's very, very difficult to continue to evolve something if every time you try to make a small change, especially if you're trying to make small changes to evolve things, if every time I try to make a small change, cust client, customer says, hey, this software has been great. We've been using it for two or three years. We want to tweak this one thing right here. Well, if I have really, really good testing in place and I can tweak that one thing, prove it works, and then give it to them, they're probably going to be fine with you know, making that small investment to let it continue to evolve. If I can't prove that quickly, then they may ask for a small change that to them is like, okay, yeah, this would this should cost about $1,000 in time, and then we'll get it to our customer and start benefiting from it this, this week. But if they try to make a small change and we're like, okay, yeah, you know, that's going to take six months for us to test that, just that small change, 
then there's a big hesitancy to make changes. And so you end up with more and more debt, if you will, or more and more things that need to be changed that haven't just because it's hard to, to justify them. Then that happens from what the customer is asking for, but it also happens for the way that the developers think about the code. Um, if I... If I know that making a small change may break something and it's really expensive for me to prove it, if I find something that's wrong and could be improved, even something as simple as saying, oh, we need to update this framework because it's out of date and there's some security concerns. If I can easily try the new framework, run all my tests, say, hey, that's good, let's push it out in the next change, I'm much more likely to do that and keep the software up to date, letting it continue to evolve, than if I know if I change something, it's going to take me six weeks of testing. So that, that's why I'm making that, that statement. Uh, here's Martin Fowler, the one that we were quoting earlier. And he said, if my high level tests are fast, reliable, and cheap to modify, then lower level tests aren't needed. So he's actually saying, if I can run high level tests and, and actually get a lot of value from them and they give me good return on investment, then I don't need lower level tests. Now, I am not telling you um, that you should go out and get rid of all your, your unit tests here. The point is your higher level tests probably aren't always going to be fast, reliable, and cheap to modify. So you're going to have to have a balance there. But what I really like about this is Martin Fowler is calling out, he's, he's thinking in terms of what's the value I get from this? How much does it cost me and how much value do I get from it? So you're thinking in terms of how much will it cost me to maintain this test, but also how much value do I get from it? And if those things are really, really expensive to maintain and very little value, Maybe it doesn't make sense to go ahead and do that. But he's saying if they're really, really inexpensive to maintain, actually testing the high level test from the standpoint of how the user experiences it is pretty high value being able to do that. And so you want to write tests that, that balance those, those things. Um, so that's why I really like this, this quote because it's not because it's telling you how your test should look for your particular situation. It's telling you what you need to value in trying to decide how you set up your tests. Okay, so uh, I mentioned BDD and TDD. Here's what these loops look like. TDD, or behavior-driven development, we've done other talks on these and I'll, I'll do more in the future, but uh, write a scenario, watch it fail, make it executable. So now we have something that proves our application does not do what the customer expects it to do. Then we get into a loop here where we're gonna write a simple test at a unit level, watch it fail, write code, the test eventually passes, we refactor and we keep going through that loop in the TDD loop until our scenario passes and then we move on to our next, next scenario. Those two things together are very, very powerful. And it often produce tests that look, um, this will often produce tests that look something like a bottom heavy hourglass because you've got lots of TDD tests being produced here, everything you need to drive your development. You may have fewer in the integration levels layers because, like Martin Fowler was saying, he may find the integration level layers don't provide any more value than the stuff that's, that's at the higher level. And those things, um, and, and they're going to write those anyway, so there's fewer they're integrating, and that's all being tested when you test that it works from the standpoint of the user. So different things depending on your software, depending on your, skill, your team's skill set, uh, but these two things together will produce very good coverage um, and software that's usually pretty easy to evolve or can be easy to evolve going forward. Okay, um, so we got two more things here. I want to get some feedback from you and then we're going to do a uh, competitive quiz, see what you what you remember from, from things and give away a, a t-shirt here. But I want to throw a little thing out here, something that I've been kind of thinking about. Um, I want to encourage you to think about what is the value of a 1% increase in your team's efficiency? If there was something your team could do to be 1% efficient, how much would that be worth? And I think a lot of times we don't really think about this, and so it's hard for us to make investments, whether it's investing in uh, changing our development process, investing in training, or different things like that. So for a lot of teams, if you've got 10 developers, it's likely that you're spending probably more than you know, a million dollars a year on, on something. A 1% increase in that would be pretty significant. Um, there's a lot of stuff you could justify doing if you thought you could get a 1% increase from it, either in tooling, in training, in, in lots of things like that. So leaving you with this thought, and I'll probably send out an email about this later, um, most of my consulting has been with people for many years at, at a time. And I'm trying to look for ways to give people smaller increases, you know, helping to enable their teams. 
The Lunch and Learns are part of that. I do for free and it's great, but sometimes you don't get a whole team. And so you don't end up with kind of that critical mass to move, move forward. So I'm working on some stuff to try to do smaller, like working with the team for four weeks, I'm doing four training sessions that are designed to deal with specific things that they're dealing with. So a lot of the content from the Lunch and Learn, but customized for exactly what that team is trying to um, improve along with some coaching sessions. So if that sounds interesting to your team and you'd like to see a proposal put together, send me an email and I'd love to kind of talk to you about and come up with some very targeted, here's how we think we can get a 1%, 2%, whatever, increase in efficiency for your particular team. Okay, presentation feedback. I'm going to give you just a few minutes to, to do this and then we're going to go into the uh, the quiz. So please do feel the, fill this out. Like I said, I do reread these. Um, I, I read through these and they help me adjust things. They also help because when I get ready to do this talk again, I can go through and kind of get a feel for what was useful and what wasn't and then make some tweaks to it. So it's just, um, I think there's four questions. Um, so it should just take a few, few minutes. Shouldn't take very long. So fill that out really quick. And then we are going to be giving away a t-shirt. We're going to do a, a, a quiz and give away a t-shirt. This is my, we value face-to-face -face communication. Turn your video on. Um, we printed a bunch of these up, particularly when everybody was home for COVID and um, then kept on printing them because people like them. So anyway, we will be giving away one of those. I think I've got all the sizes. If we end up not having your size and you win, we will come up with a, uh, an alternative prize, a book or something. Okay, so get that filled out and short answers are fine. Don't feel you've got, they've got to be long or anything. Just what did you think of the presentation? I think there's what did you think of uh, how well it kept your attention and then anything you think we should improve or anything um, that really stuck out to you that we should make sure we keep. I should have put in my uh, my pyramid music here, the, uh, the exciting music. OK, so while we're, we're building this out, though, um, I will mention we're going to do a talk next week. I think we're going to cover Agile Fundamentals. We're going to take a little bit of a break through this summer. I've got a lot of travel and stuff with, with um, family and things. So I'm going to probably be doing some talks uh, a little bit more sporadically through the summer, and then we'll be picking up every week again at the end of the uh, year. So watch for those invites as they come out. I think I'm also going to try to hit some different time zones. So uh, if you've got a team that's like, hey, we would really love to come, but it's 4 o'clock in the morning, um, how would you, how about doing something for our time zone? Let me know and I'll, I'll see if we can accommodate that uh, because I want to try to hit some on the East Coast and maybe some over in, in Europe that, uh, to make those available for people that might not have been able to. So we'll hit some interesting topics. Also, uh, Chris Stone was going to do it next week. He had some stuff come up, so we'll be trying to bring him on in the fall as well. Okay, let's give it, okay, we got 38 people done, 10 underway. We've got 100 and I see there's 102 people here. Uh, if you haven't clicked on it, let me add it to the chat just one more time here. Uh, please do click on that and at least answer the two questions there, just rating things on the one to five. And we will give it about 30 seconds left before we go on to the next thing. I can't run these at the same time. So please at least do the, the filling out the, um, the, what you thought of, of the talk, even if you don't give the, uh, the details. Okay. It's about 15 seconds left. And then we will move on. I'm almost here. And then we're going to do a game to see who gets a t-shirt mailed to them this week. Okay, so moving on. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, curse of the testing pyramid. So go ahead and bring that up and let's have fun. Okay, what happened to Howard Carter's canary after the tomb was open? What happened to Howard Carter's canary after the tomb was open? It flew away, it died in the coal mine, it was scared to death, or it was swallowed by a serpent. What happened to Howard Carter's canary after the tomb was open? Two seconds left. And yes, it was scared to death. They got it out of the serpent's mouth, but it had died from probably from fear is what they think. So good job. Next question. Oh, our leaderboard. Forgot the most important. We've got Alex M in the top, followed by Eli. We've got lots of thousand points. Hopefully we'll winnow you guys down. 
if we have if everybody ends up winning, we will randomly choose somebody from from the list. Okay, so I'm not sending out all of my shirt stock. Okay, next question. What is one major difference in the way tests run now than the way they ran in the past? Is it all tests are cursed because they were run in an Egyptian tomb? The cloud and containers let you run more tests faster and in parallel. Screen recording software no longer makes brittle tests. We can hire Martians to run all of our tests, or we no longer have to test UI changes. Two seconds remaining, and time's up. Yes, the cloud and containers let you run more tests faster and in parallel, and that's a big difference that kind of changes the cost benefit from what we necessarily had in the past. Leaderboard, Alex M is still in the top spot. We've windowed it down to the top spot. Well, we've got six people in there. Of Eli, Eric B, Maya, Taylor, and Christopher L. What was a key benefit of behavior-driven development? Was it better screen recording software, faster computers, tests written by developers, testing is now taught in college, you don't have to refactor your tests, or tests don't fail very often? What was a key benefit of behavior-driven development that we mentioned in this talk? Two seconds remaining, and time's up. Yes, tests written by developers. So the tests and the backing code are written by the developers, so you've got that integration of if something breaks, it's like, oh, okay, I know what I changed, I can fix the test, or I didn't change anything, something's not working the way I expect it to. Leaderboard, Eric V and Taylor are now in the top spots, followed by Alex M, Jack Sparrow, Maya, Guest032, Rhett, I think that's how you say it, Christopher, Aaron, and Richard G. Next question. What is a key technique to make tests less brittle? Key technique mentioned to make tests less brittle. Is it page objects, JUnit, cloud technologies, or Kubernetes? Key technique to make tests less brittle. Five seconds left. We've got 30 second, 36 answers in. And yes, page objects is the technique to make tests less brittle because you abstract the way things are laid out on the page from what you're trying to do. Like if you're trying to log in, you're saying I want to log in and you can use that everywhere. And if the login methods change or the way that you interact with the way it change, you can change that just in the page object. Okay, we got Eric V and Taylor in the two top spots, followed by Alex M, Jack Sparrow, Maya, Guest032, Christopher, Aaron, Rhett, and Richard. I think this is the last question. BDD represents an improvement to test-driven development, a fundamentally different way of doing development, a curse brought on us from Tutankhamun's tomb, an alternative to test-driven development, a way to follow safe, or a drop-in replacement for HPALM. What does behavior-driven development represent? And yes, a fundamentally different way of doing development. We often focus just on the fact that we're going to get um, regression tests out of it, which is very, very valuable and enables a lot of what the value you get from behavior-driven development, but that's really not the key thing of just trying to use it as a drop-in replacement for your testing. It's a fundamentally different way of doing development that lets you work in small iterations and work in closer collaboration with your customer, your testers, and your developers. Leaderboard and Taylor has the top spot by, by just a few points. So very good, Taylor. Send me an email, you send me a screenshot, or I'll probably trust you anyway, um, unless I get a bunch of Taylors emailing me. And I will, uh, and your shirt size and address, and I will get a shirt headed your way. I think I've still got every size, so just let me know and we'll uh, get one headed your way. So thank you so much, everyone, for, for coming. This was a lot of fun. I'm going to stick around if anybody's got any questions. Um, but thanks for participating. And uh, I'm looking forward to reading the comments, see what people thought of the, uh, of the, um, see what people thought of, of this talk, since it's a little bit out there, but it was fun to do. So if you've got any thoughts, comments, or aggravations, I would love to hear them. So feel free to come off mute and speak up or throw something in the chat and I'll try to respond to it.
Uh, okay, somebody was asking, what software did I use to create uh, your cartoons on Agile methodologies? So um, that's called Vyond. It used to be called, I can't remember what it used to be called, but it's V-Y-O-N-D. And it gives you an interface kind of like PowerPoint for creating animations. It's, um, it's very easy to get simple animations, but you can do a whole lot of stuff with it if you really put the time into like storyboarding and stuff. But Vyond, V-Y-O-N-D. There's Cartoonly as well that isn't quite as flexible, but it's a little bit easier sometimes to get started with. Yeah, check it out. Hey, Mark. It's a lot of fun. Hey, Mark, this is Taylor. Hey, Taylor. Hey, uh, great job as always. Thank you very much. Um, Thanks for coming. Yeah, so just want to follow up a little bit again on that um, on the question with, uh, with, with our automated tester. So, mm -hmm. Um, our team did not have a tester uh, for quite a while. We just hired one, which means, you know, we were still doing manual testing. Um, now, now they were hired to do, you know, the automation piece. Um, do you think it's like, like, I want, I, I want to tell the team, like, hey, uh, <laughs> if these tests are not part of our pipeline, like, these are just going to become um, uh, basically forgotten about. Um, right. It's going to become very difficult. We're we're facing an uphill battle. I mean, that's my experience. I was a, I was a tester for ten years, and mm -hmm. any time we did testing um, after the fact or automated testing after the fact, it was um, just kind of became a waste uh, of time and money. So, just wondering any sort of a, any additional advice. I I think. One thing that sometimes can help is try to get the team focused on how are we going to leverage this to improve our process, not just assuming that if somebody wrote tests a year ago that they're somehow valuable, right? You're, you're going to, if you're thinking of how it's going to change your process, then, it's, then you have to think in terms of like, okay, we've got these tests. Are we going to set them up to where the developers can run them locally so they can get feedback before they check stuff in? Are we going to put them in the pipeline so it fails the pipeline before it goes on? And if it does fail and there's something wrong, who's who's going to fix it? Are we going to say, oh, well, that's the automated tester needs to figure out what's going on? Because if if you're in a situation that when a test fails, the developer's like, yeah, that's somebody else's job, you've lost all the value of them, right? Because they're not actually using it to change their code, and then you just start ignoring it. So true. Yeah, definitely agree. Okay. No, I appreciate it. Thank you. But, but yeah, the, I, I think a very big piece is, is talking about how <laughs> it's easy for us to want somebody else to fix all of our problems. You know, we're going to give it to an automated tester and they're going to just make our problems away. But it doesn't work like that. We've got to, the developers are going to have to change how they work to take advantage of what an automated tester is creating for them. Now, I think kind of merging those roles is what I've seen as working best. Um, that doesn't mean you, you can't get value out of it. But if, if you've got people that think that somebody else is going to handle it and they're not going to have to think about it at all because now they can just spend more time writing code and not thinking about testing, you're probably not, you're probably going to spend a lot of money and not get anything out of it. That makes sense. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good, good, very good question though. That it's challenging. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Thank you. Any other questions, thoughts, aggravations, funny jokes? And Taylor, make sure you send me an email so I can get you your shirt. Okay, I'll wait a few more seconds. If you want to chat, just come off mute or put something in the chat. If not, I've got a question, Mark. Yes. So, and I'm not sure how to really frame this question well, but you know, I've got a situation with um, you know the team's doing some automation testing. They're doing a lot of manual, so they're trying to make that migration. Mm -hmm. But they also have this mindset. And this is a little bit off, maybe from the topic today, but this mindset that they have to test everything from A to Z with minute detail in all cases. That's what they're used to doing in a manual repetitive approach. But, mm -hmm. you know, instead of thinking, hey, can I, you know, can I test an area functionally 
and better yet have some automation that helps me test that functionally and get some confidence from that. And so that later, maybe I can repeat that automation test, but even if it's manual, not have to repeat A to Z. I built some confidence on that. Maybe I touch certain areas of it again in the next environment or something. Can you speak right. to that at all? Just kind of that whole issue? So, um, okay, so, so a couple issues uh, around that. One, I usually try to get teams to stop thinking so much about what the percentage of code coverage is, which isn't exactly what, you, what you're saying, but a lot of times we get focused so much on the code coverage, and I want to know how confident are you that this isn't going to do something bad in production, right? And if, if I've got 50% code coverage, or I've only executed code on 50% of it, or only 50% of the tests I could possibly do, but I've got 99% confidence that nothing's going to go wrong in production from this, that extra 50%, if that gets me to 99.2%, is it worth doing? Uh, and some of it depends on what what, sh what your software does. Um, if it's flying airplanes, maybe that is worth it. If it's showing cat videos, it probably isn't. Um, and most people will fall somewhere uh, between that. So I think that's one thing is making sure that people are making sure the team's really, really focused on what's my confidence, because there are some tests that give you great confidence that everything works correctly. There are other tests that don't really provide much of that. So that that's one way to get people to kind of sift through and say, okay, what's worth running again? What are things that are, there's really very little chance that it could could have changed. The other thing that um, that kind of comes out of that is getting teams to start thinking about what are the things that are really expensive for us to do manually, but provide really, really high confidence. So um, like one example I can think of is it was a, like a banking system. And one of the things they wanted to make sure they did is check every single page. There was like 20 different uh, types of users. And they want to make sure that every single page of this application either let the user in or didn't based on whether, you know, the admin could get into all these pages, but a client could not see the admin pages. And they were really, really concerned that they might make a change that would let the clients get into the admin page. So they wrote, te they were like, this is really, really important, but it takes a long time to test, you know, these 20 pages with all these different, uh, different user types. So they automated that and built a framework in BDD that would let them, if they add another page, it was pretty easy to add the ability to check for those things too. But it was it was something that was really, really high value, very, very important, but very, very expensive to test. And so it by thinking through that, they were able to say, okay, here's the area we want to invest in because it is really important. If we get this wrong, it's it's really, really bad for us. But at the same time, it's really, really expensive. Well, that's where automated testing, you know, time ought to be spent on. These other things are really, really simple to test. We'd like to automate them someday, but the cost benefit isn't there for it. Does that does that help at all? Yeah, I think that's on a, several good aspects, but I do appreciate that. Thank you. Cool. That's, yeah, good. Uh, very good question. Yeah, I think those are some critical things to be thinking about is where, to, where you kind of get the bang for the buck and and you know add your confidence and then i think you're that overall confidence perspective of getting them to think about hopefully if i tested this area i'm i'm pretty confident overall with the system and and maybe i don't have to worry about some other area that's kind of it's a so not as critical or something like that so, right yeah. and, and i think it's helpful also to think with this change what could actually go wrong um, there are some changes I make that's like, hey, we tried changing the color of this button. We know what's deployed right now works. Do I really want to do I really want to spend two, three, ten thousand dollars worth of effort retesting the entire application? Because if I get the button wrong, probably the worst thing that would happen is the button just wouldn't show up if the color's wrong on it. Um, that might not be worth ten thousand dollars, depending on the application. Right. Great. Thank you. Cool. Appreciate Good question. Yeah, thanks for thanks for asking. Anyone else? Thoughts, comments, questions?